Listen, I know we're all caught up, as we should be, in the election. Trump, what he's going to do first, Elon, everything that's going on in the world, right? But we cannot forget, let's not forget to keep our eye on the Vatican. Everyone has their secrets, even me, and yes, even you. Literally nobody, nor nowhere, is a fully open book. <laughs> not even the most holy place of all, the Vatican. In fact, it might shock you to learn the Vatican has more secrets than most. And we know some of them. And soon, so will you. These are 15 secrets the Vatican doesn't want you to know. Number 15. The Vatican's Secret Tribunal. The Apostolic Penitentiary is a hidden court established by Pope Alexander III in 1179 to address sins of the gravest nature. This tribunal, cloaked in secrecy until 2009, deals with cases so severe that only the Pope himself can grant absolution. While priests and bishops can absolve sins as grave as genocide, the secret court handles even more serious transgressions. These include attempts on the Pope's life, breaches of the confessional seal by priests, and other offenses considered worse than genocide. Decisions regarding such cases are made by the Pope and the tribunal's head, the major penitentiary, in private meetings. These sessions are considered matters of conscience and are kept away from public scrutiny, with the details remaining strictly confidential. Number 14. The Mysterious Vatican Secret Archives the Vatican secret archives span 53 miles of shelves and contain documents dating back 12 centuries. Despite being labeled secret, these archives are known to exist, though access is severely restricted. Only a select few, including vetted scholars and journalists, can explore these documents, and even then, only after a stringent approval process. The archives have sparked countless rumors, including claims that they contain evidence of extraterrestrial life, proof that Jesus didn't exist, and other explosive revelations about the Catholic Church. The archives have been passed down from Pope to Pope since 463 AD, and documents are only made available 75 years after their creation. This delay means that records related to controversial topics such as Pope Pius XII's actions during the Holocaust or the Church's various abuse scandals remain hidden from the public. Don't that sound familiar? Hmm? They'll only be released. What does that sound like that we deal with with our government? When something is finally declassified? Hmm. Sort of similar, right? Just different words, different verbiage that they use, but all the same. Crazy, right? Conveniently, these records won't be accessible for some time. In 2019, the Vatican renamed these storied archives the Vatican Apostolic Archives, but the mystery surrounding them persists. Number 13. The Rarely Seen Retirement of Popes Imagine a job that you must hold until your last breath. In the Catholic Church, popes are generally expected to serve until they die. Of the 123 popes elected over the past millennium, only five have resigned. The first was Benedict IX, who became pope in his early 20s and is the only person to have served multiple terms. Forced out in 1036, he returned months later only to resign again in 1045, hoping to marry. When his love interest rejected him, he briefly reclaimed the papacy before being removed for good in 1047. She takes after you. Ego te baptizo in nomine patris. The second resignation came from Pope Gregory VI, who stepped down in 1046 under pressure from the bishops. In 1294, Pope Celestine V resigned after just five months, fearing he was unfit for the role. His successor imprisoned him to prevent any attempt to reclaim the papacy, and Celestine died in captivity ten months later. In 1415, amidst a schism with two reigning popes, Gregory XII resigned to resolve the crisis, allowing the removal of the rival pope in Avignon and restoring unity to the church. The most recent resignation was that of Pope Benedict XVI in 2013, who cited health reasons for stepping down. However, rumors suggest he was forced out due to leaked reports of his struggles with church management and transparency. Number 12. Is drinking a sin? 
if drinking were considered a sin, a substantial portion of the global population would be in trouble, especially those living in Vatican City. Interestingly, Vatican residents are said to consume more wine per person than any other country in the world. As with crime statistics, the per capita figure can be misleading. However, according to The Independent, the average Vatican citizen drinks about 74 liters of wine each year. To put that into perspective, this is double the amount consumed by the average resident of Italy or France, three times more than a person in the UK, and six times more than the average American. This high consumption rate is attributed to a few demographic factors, such as the population being generally older, upper class, and well-educated males. Additionally, meals are often communal, leading to more frequent wine consumption. The regular use of wine in religious ceremonies like communion also plays a role. Number 11. Yeah, I get all of that, and that could very well be true. Let's slide that to the side. People also drink when they're stressed, right? They may want to forget something or not think about something or whatever, and they turn to drinking. So add that to the reasons, too. Don't just give us the, the cool stuff as to why they're, oh, well, it's because it's with food. Cool, but it's other reasons, too. Pope Benedict XVI, a Nazi? Born Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI was conscripted into the German Anti-Aircraft Corps in 1943 while he was still studying in the seminary. The little-known fact that he was once part of the Hitler Youth led to some controversy just before his election as Pope in 2005, three days after his 78th birthday. As a young soldier, Ratzinger underwent training in Munich and later worked in a BMW aircraft engine factory in Trostburg. Photos from that time show him in a paramilitary uniform at a factory where hundreds of forced laborers in concentration camp uniforms also worked. In 1945, Ratzinger deserted his post and was captured, spending time in a prisoner of war camp. He later passed an investigation by the Weissenthal Center, which cleared him of any accusations of anti-Semitism. Number 10. The Duplessis Orphans In the 1930s and 1940s, Quebec's premier Maurice Duplessis, supported by the Catholic Church, initiated a conservative revolution that led to an era known as the Great Darkness. Duplessis, with the Church's backing, orchestrated a shocking scheme to reclassify orphaned children as mentally ill, even when they weren't. This misdiagnosis was financially motivated as orphans brought in a subsidy of $1.25 per day, while mental patients were worth $2.75 daily. Tragically, many of these children were subjected to unnecessary lobotomies, shock treatments, and physical restraints, suffering significant abuse. Around 20,000 children were wrongfully labeled as mentally ill, leading to a lifetime of trauma. Later, these individuals, known as the Duplessis Orphans, sought justice and compensation from the Canadian government, eventually receiving a financial settlement from Quebec. Despite this, the Catholic Church has yet to apologize for its involvement in the scandal. Number 9. Guidelines for Priests Who Father Children until the 12th century, Catholic priests were allowed to marry, but a shift in church doctrine imposed celibacy and banned marriage among priests. Over the years, the vow of celibacy has been challenged, particularly when it comes to priests fathering children. In 2017, the Catholic Church in Ireland took a significant step by publishing guidelines for priests who father children, acknowledging publicly for the first time that such situations do occur despite the celibacy requirement. In 2019, CBS News interviewed Vincent Doyle, the founder of Coping International, a support group for the children of priests. His organization's website now supports 50,000 users across 175 countries, providing much-needed assistance to those affected by this issue. Number 8. Terrible Popes – The Dark Side of the Papacy One might assume that the role of the Pope would be reserved for men of high moral standing and sound judgment. However, throughout the 2,000-year history of the Catholic Church, some Popes have been notorious for their lack of both. Among the 266 men who have held the papal office, several have earned infamy for their misdeeds. John the Twain, who served as pope from 955 to 964, is often cited as one of the worst, marked by deceit, cruelty, and utter recklessness. Known for his violent and immoral behavior, John the Twain was a murderer, a gambler, and an adulterer, earning him the title of the worst pope in history. Yet perhaps the most infamous of all was Alexander VI, 
whose notoriety even inspired a book by E.R. Chamberlain titled The Bad Popes. Born Rodrigo Borgia, Alexander VI led the church from 1492 to 1503. The Borgia family, known for their criminal activities, were one of the most powerful families in Renaissance Rome. Alexander VI was so corrupt and power-hungry that he became a character in Assassin's Creed II. He was accused of murder, nepotism, and fathering several children from multiple affairs. Another notorious pope was Stephen VI, who ruled for a brief period from 896 to 897 before being executed due to his bizarre behavior. Stephen VI harbored such hatred for his predecessor, Pope Formosus, that he exhumed Formosus's corpse and put it on trial. He screamed accusations at the dead pope, mutilated the body, and then had it thrown into the Tiber River. His I thought I knew hatred before. But that's a different level of hatred, bro. Like, I don't think I've ever experienced that level of hatred. I don't have that type of hate in my body, bro. That, to dig up a bot, yeah, yeah, you, 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 you different, you, you different. Actions outraged the people of Rome, leading to his downfall and execution. Formosus was later reburied with honor, and the church instituted a new rule to prevent the trial of deceased individuals. Now it's time for the sweet topic. Did Joe Biden have dinner with some kind of interdimensional demon at a dinner party at the Vatican? Some mad conspiracy theorists are claiming so. It's mad if you ask us. Totally mad. And there's literally no evidence to back it up, hence why we've relegated it to the sweet topic spot. But hey, we thought we'd humor it for a bit. These images are an artist's recreation of what we've heard happened. People claim that in the days leading up to Joe Biden visiting the Vatican, a strange wolf monster was seen in the area. Then, during Biden's stay, the beast vanished. People convinced themselves this meant the monster and Biden had a meeting in the Vatican, and the reason it wasn't seen while he was there is because it was in the building with Joe, eating with it. As far as we're concerned, it's nonsense, but hey, what do you think? As always, let us know your thoughts in the comments section down below using the hashtag SweetTopic. Number 7. The Woman Pope, The Legend of Pope Joan According to legend, a medieval woman once disguised herself as a man and ascended to the highest position in the Roman Catholic Church. Known as Pope Joan, or officially Pope John VIII, she was supposedly elected after the death of Pope Leo IV. As the story goes, Joan gained a reputation as a respected teacher and scholar in Athens before eventually making her way to Rome. However, the tale takes a strange twist when Joan, disguised as John VIII, becomes pregnant. Her secret was revealed when she gave birth in the street during a procession. Enraged witnesses are said to have tied her to a horse and dragged her to her death. Despite the enduring popularity of this story, historians have largely dismissed it as a myth likely concocted by early critics of the church. Number six. Can you imagine? Can you imagine somebody running for, a, let's just say president, since the election just occurred? And we're thinking the whole time, it's a man or a woman or whatever. And then we find out a year or two into the presidency that we were lied to the whole time. Could you imagine the uproar that would send our country? Woo, bro. And the reason why I say that because, hey, man, sometimes history is doing to repeat itself. So we got we to gotta be on the lookout. We got to pay attention. Sexual abuse cases, a scandal that shook the church. Sexual abuse scandals have been a devastating blemish on the Catholic Church for decades, with thousands of cases involving predatory priests coming to light. The first significant reports emerged in the United States during the mid-1980s. However, some of the most infamous cases, particularly in Ireland and Austria, didn't become public until the mid-1990s. In Ireland, the scandal surrounding disgraced priest Brendan Smith even contributed to the downfall of the government in 1994. For years, there was no policy in place to protect children or to ensure that such crimes were reported to the authorities. Church leaders have since issued numerous apologies for the actions of both past and present clergy. In the United States, persistent investigative journalism by the Boston Globe exposed widespread abuse by priests and prompted victims worldwide to come forward. Between 2000 and 2010, numerous U.S. dioceses reached settlements with victims. 
In 2019, Pope Francis vowed that all abusers would be brought to justice, signaling a long overdue commitment to addressing the church's darkest secrets. Number five, crime capital of the world, the Vatican's unlikely title. Vatican City, the smallest country in the world spanning just 110 acres, has earned the unexpected title of the crime capital of the world. Despite its small population of around 1,000 residents, the Vatican sees an extraordinary number of criminal cases. In 2006, with fewer than 500 residents, the city recorded 341 civil cases and 486 criminal cases. However, it's not the residents who are responsible for most of the crime, it's the millions of tourists who visit each year. The crowds of visitors make the Vatican a haven for pickpockets and petty thieves. The situation is made more complicated by the lack of a prison within the city and the presence of just one judge. Criminals caught in Vatican City are typically escorted across the border into Italy as part of an agreement between the two nations, allowing Italy to handle the prosecution. This unusual arrangement highlights the unique challenges of maintaining law and order in such a small yet heavily visited sovereign state. Number 4. Vatican Bank Scandals – A History of Financial Turmoil the Vatican Bank, officially known as the Institute for the Works of Religion, has been a source of controversy since its inception in 1942. Established during World War II to sidestep financial restrictions imposed by the Allies, the bank quickly gained notoriety for its secretive operations. It earned a spot on Business Insider's list of the top five most scandal-ridden institutions, thanks to its murky dealings. Due to its exemption from wartime financial regulations, the Vatican Bank became a haven for those looking to conduct transactions away from prying eyes, gaining a reputation as the world's premier offshore bank. In the 1970s, the bank's connections to organized crime became apparent when it was implicated in laundering $900 million in counterfeit bonds and securities. One of the most infamous incidents involved Archbishop Marcinkus, who was both the chief of papal security and head of the Vatican Bank. He was linked to the collapse of Michel Sindona's financial empire after losing $30 million of Sindona's funds. By the Holy See for mismanaging the sex abuse crisis and mismanaging the fund. This scandal was just the beginning. The collapse of Banco Ambrosiano remains the most notorious as the bank lost $1.4 billion in unsecured loans tied to the Vatican Bank. Although the Vatican paid $244 million in a settlement, it never admitted to any wrongdoing. In 2009, an Italian journalist published a book detailing the bank's history of corruption, including fake charity accounts, money laundering, and embezzlement. Despite this negative exposure, the scandals continued. In 2012, four priests were investigated for operating mafia-linked accounts, and in 2013, another priest was arrested for using the bank to smuggle millions of euros for the mob. It seems the Vatican has preferred to face legal consequences rather than risk crossing paths with organized crime. Number 3. Smuggling Nazis to Safety – The Vatican's Role after the defeat of Nazi Germany in World War II, Europe became a dangerous place for former Nazi officials, who quickly sought refuge elsewhere. Surprisingly, they received help from both the Vatican and the Red Cross in their escape efforts. Thousands of documents leaked from the archives of the International Committee of the Red Cross ICRC, to Harvard University researcher Gerald Steinecker have shed light on how notorious war criminals like Adolf Eichmann, Josef Mengele, and Klaus Barbie managed to evade capture. During the chaotic post-war period, the Red Cross relied heavily on Vatican references and military checks to issue travel documents known as 10 to 100. S. Steinecker's research indicates that the Red Cross issued at least 120,000 of these documents, with 90% of the ex-Nazis fleeing Europe through Italy. The Vatican Refugee Commission also played a crucial role by providing Nazi fugitives with false identities. Despite growing evidence, the Vatican has consistently refused to comment or release the relevant documents from its secret archives. However, Pope Francis promised in 2020 to make these records public, potentially shedding more light on this dark chapter of history. Number 2. Rwandan Genocide – The Church's Involvement in 2017, Pope Francis issued an apology for the role of the Catholic Church in the 1994 Rwandan genocide, but many argue that an apology is far from sufficient given the gravity of the events. During the genocide, 
which took place between April and July 1994, members of the Catholic clergy in Rwanda were accused of aiding the slaughter of the Tutsi ethnic group. Survivors and Rwandan government officials have reported that thousands of victims were killed in churches where they had sought refuge, while some priests and nuns courageously protected people by hiding them in churches, rectories, and convents, others shockingly participated in the genocide. One notorious figure was Father Athanasa Saromba, who ordered bulldozers to demolish his parish church, killing 2,000 people inside. Sisters Gertrude and Maria also betrayed those seeking sanctuary, leading militia groups to the convent and garage where women and children were hiding. Both Father Saromba and the sisters were eventually prosecuted for their roles in these horrific crimes. The involvement of church members in the Rwandan genocide remains a deeply troubling aspect of the church's history. Beyond these high-profile cases, the complicity of the Catholic Church in the genocide was widespread, with many clergy members actively participating in or enabling the violence. For example, there were reports of priests refusing to offer shelter to fleeing Tutsis or even turning them over to the militias. In some instances, churches, which were traditionally seen as places of sanctuary, became sites of mass murder, with thousands of people slaughtered in what should have been safe havens. The aftermath of the genocide left deep scars on Rwanda's Catholic community and led to a significant decline in trust in the church. Many Rwandans who had once viewed the church as a moral authority began to question its role and the sincerity of its teachings. This you can only wonder what type of judgment someone would receive for using religion to do just heinous and acts and things that were done to people and the killings. It's, it's just you can only imagine what type of judgment comes for a person like that or people. This crisis of faith was exacerbated by the fact that some of the clergy members who participated in the genocide fled the country and sought refuge in other nations sometimes with the assistance of the church. Efforts to bring those responsible to justice have been ongoing. The International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, ICTR, and Rwandan courts have prosecuted several clergy members for their involvement in the genocide. Father Saramba was sentenced to life imprisonment by the ICTR in 2006, and sisters Gertrude and Maria were convicted by Rwandan courts. These convictions, while significant, represent only a fraction of those involved and many victims and their families continue to seek justice. In the years following the genocide, the Catholic Church in Rwanda has made efforts to atone for its role in the atrocities. These efforts include public apologies, the establishment of memorials, and participation in reconciliation initiatives aimed at healing the deep divisions within Rwandan society. However, these actions have not fully mitigated the damage done to the church's reputation in Rwanda and beyond. The Rwandan genocide also prompted the Vatican to reflect on its broader role in global conflicts and the responsibilities of religious leaders in times of crisis. The events in Rwanda have been cited in discussions about the church's need for greater accountability and transparency, particularly in its dealings with governments and its own members. Despite these efforts, the shadow of the Rwandan genocide continues to loom large over the Catholic Church. The failure to prevent, and in some cases, the active participation in such horrific violence, remains a significant moral stain on the institution. For many, the Church's involvement in the genocide serves as a stark reminder of the potential for religious institutions to be complicit in atrocities when they fail to uphold their moral and ethical responsibilities. This tragic chapter in the Church's history is a powerful example of the need for ongoing vigilance and accountability within religious organizations organizations, ensuring that they serve as true protectors of peace and justice, rather than enablers of violence and hatred. The legacy of the Rwandan genocide continues to challenge the Catholic Church to confront its past and to work towards a future where such horrors are never repeated. Number 1. The Vatican's Army of Exorcists, a resurgence of the ancient ritual. If you know someone who's been acting strangely or saying things that make no sense, they might be possessed. Or at least that's what some believe. Fortunately, the Catholic Church has a group of priests specifically trained to deal with such situations. These priests aren't your typical clergy. They are part of an elite group recognized by the Vatican specializing in the ancient practice of exorcism. While exorcisms might seem like something from the Middle Ages or horror films, the ritual has experienced a resurgence in modern times, particularly since the early 1990s 
when the International Association of Exorcists was established. And I don't think it's just in the, in the way that they took place back then. I think some of the possessions are changed nowadays. And I think some people who go on like these violent acts and commit these heinous crimes and do different things have some form of possession in them that allows them to something in their brain or, or take over them to do certain things. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to believe that not in all cases, but in some cases with some of the stuff I've seen lately. This organization, comprised of priests from 51 countries, includes around 400 trained exorcists in Italy alone. In Italy, the demand for exorcisms is remarkably high, with hundreds of thousands of requests each year. The popularity of exorcisms has grown so much that the late Father Gabriele Amorth, a renowned Vatican exorcist, claimed to have performed 130,000 exorcisms during his lifetime. This staggering number highlights the persistent belief in demonic possession and the continued relevance of exorcisms within the church. Over time, the methods used in exorcisms have also evolved. For example, in 2018, 89-year-old Cardinal Ernest Simone reported performing up to five exorcisms a day over the phone from his home in Albania. Similarly, Bob Larson, founder of the International School of Exorcism, has adapted to modern technology by offering his services via Skype. Exorcism, once considered a relic of a bygone era, has found new life in the digital age. The Catholic Church officially recognizes the practice, and the demand for trained exorcists has increased significantly over the years. In response, the Vatican has continued to support and expand its network of exorcists to meet this growing need. The Church's approach to exorcism has also become more structured. The International Association of Exorcists, for instance, was officially recognized by the Vatican in 2014, giving the practice a formal stamp of approval. This organization not only trains priests in the rites of exorcism, but also provides them with ongoing support and resources. The association's goal is to ensure that exorcisms are performed correctly and that priests are well prepared to handle the psychological and spiritual challenges they may encounter. In addition to traditional exorcisms, the Church has also acknowledged the importance of distinguishing between genuine cases of possession and those that might be psychological in nature. As a result, exorcists often work closely with medical professionals to rule out mental illness before proceeding with an exorcism. This collaboration between spiritual and medical fields reflects the Church's effort to modernize the practice while maintaining its religious significance. Exorcism remains a controversial topic. Skeptics argue that the ritual is rooted in superstition and lacks scientific credibility. However, for those who believe in its power, exorcism is a vital tool for combating evil and restoring spiritual balance. The Vatican's continued support for exorcism underscores its commitment to addressing the needs of its followers, even in matters as mysterious and misunderstood as demonic possession. The demand for exorcisms isn't limited to traditionally religious countries like Italy. In the United States, for example, there has been a noticeable increase in requests for exorcisms in recent years. This trend... Where? I, I think that's something the public should know about. To be honest, come on now, where? ...has been attributed to a rise in occult practices, the popularity of supernatural-themed media, and a general sense of spiritual unrest. To meet this demand, the U.S. has seen an increase in the number of priests being trained as exorcists following the example set by their Italian counterparts. In conclusion, the Vatican's army of exorcists represents a fascinating intersection of ancient ritual and modern practice. As society continues to grapple with questions of faith, spirituality, and the unknown, the Church's exorcists remain on the front lines confronting the mysteries of possession with a blend of tradition and contemporary methods. That was quite a trip. What do you think about these secrets of the Vatican?